All right, guys, how are you all doing this morning? So before we begin, uh, we had some technical difficulties, but we're, we're still good on time right now. And so but before I start the presentation for logistics, I just want to know, where are you guys all from right now? I'm from Boston, so go Red Sox. Uh, they're not looking too hot right now, which is uh, a little disappointing. But the Celtics look quite promising in the NBA. So just rep your state or even your country if you're international in the chat. Just start spamming it in there. And then we can begin promptly. So we got some people from Pennsylvania, India, New York, California, North Carolina, Virginia, France, Pakistan. All right, we got we got a few international people in here. Washington. Oh, UK, Missouri, Virginia. Mm -hmm. Toronto. All right, that sounds good. Do you guys all have ideas for this weekend? I'm sadly gonna be sitting at my computer the entire day uh, monitor monitoring the events that's, that are happening. But uh, do you guys, uh, what are you guys gonna to program today? What languages are you gonna write in? Uh, what frameworks? Just spam them into the chat right now. Hey, we have some people from Boston. Our watch your, uh, user count right now uh, looks a little low. So if you could just start spamming the, uh, just start talking on Discord, going to all the channels, you know, get really hyped up for the event. All right, we got some Swift, Java, Python, more people from Boston, let's go. Oh, and then we also have some first time hackers, perfect. All right, guys, so we're five minutes in, so it's uh, about 10.05, so I guess we can start the, the presentation. All right. So before I begin, uh, let me just give an introduction to myself and then also my co-host, Kelly. So I'm Kevin Yang, I'm the Director of Operations, so I was just in charge of getting logistics and everything all set up. Hey everyone, my name is Kelly. I am the director of outreach for Hack for the People and I am in charge of like all our social media accounts, sending out our emails. So we're super excited to have you for the opening ceremonies. All right. So before I begin, we've already set up a Slido for everyone. So if we have any questions throughout the logistics, uh, just put them, put them in, and then this will mostly be used for Dr. Skostup's uh, talk later on this morning. And so just put in the code H4TP. So I'll just give you guys all a second for that right now. So when Slido prompts, just put in the code H4TP. Alrighty guys, I think that's enough time for everyone. So if you're still struggling to get onto the Slido, the code is H4TP, which is just an abbreviation for Hack for the People. So that's an easy way to remember it. All right, so I'm gonna start off with a pretty cliche sentence. Small steps lead to great distances. I vividly remember saying this in fourth grade. I was on the meeting rug 
thinking about Neil Armstrong's infamous moon landing quote. At the time, I didn't really understand how impactful such a sentence can be. I mean, small steps, great distances, no way, Kevin. But seriously, with all jokes aside, this idea is fundamental to humanity. Because for every great invention, there must be a prototype. For every million dollar tech company, there must be that first line of code. And so many of you attending today's opening ceremonies have never done a hackathon before, but that's okay. I still remember my first experience at a hackathon. It was definitely a little daunting. I was competing with a few friends, pretty low key. Our project revolved around gamifying the process of saving energy, basically giving people points when they consume less power. Now I gotta say, the idea was definitely there, but our coding skills were in. By the end of the hackathon, we had a pretty janky prototype that barely worked and the judges did not seem impressed. But hey, that's totally normal. It's perfectly reasonable to not finish a hackathon project because at the end of the day, it's the ideas you created, the connections you make between your peers that truly matter. You see, these small ideas, such as gamifying energy savings or making an app that shows where the nearest trash cans are, they can revolutionize the world. Let's look at some of the tech giants of today. iRobot was founded because people didn't have time to clean up their homes. It's now, the leading, it's now leading in the industry for home automation and specifically robot cleaning. Now, let's look at SpaceX. Elon Musk founded the private space company off of one simple idea. Let's reuse rockets. It's so simple. You don't even need to be an astrophysicist to understand the consequences of such an idea. You see, we all got to start somewhere. And with issues like COVID-19 preventing us from going outside, with the uncertainty surrounding voter turnout this election, to even the looming threat of COVID of climate change, the fact that you're all attending this hackathon goes to show that the future of the world is in good hands. So enough rambling on, and let's get into the actual meat of today's presentation. So first, I'm gonna throw some statistics at you. Right now, we have over 600 80 signups on DevPost. Let that sink in, 680. Now, besides the crazy amount of signups on DevPost, you have over 25 mentors ready to answer your toughest questions, be it how to run a GANnet on your computer to the best time to drink coffee. All right, that's enough from me. So Kelly, take it away for tracks, prizes, and logistics. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kevin. So we're going to start off by talking about our four main tracks. So they are, you'll see right here, social, cultural, economic, political, and environmental. So as you can see, our tracks are very generalized. So your hack may likely fit under more than one, one track. As long as you make a connection in your pitch to a given track, you're eligible to win that track's prize. This means that projects can be eligible for many prizes. And in fact, we highly encourage you to think outside the box and innovate solutions to multiple tracks. All projects must be connected to at least one of these main four tracks. For example, you could create a web app that helps Alzheimer's patients through AR. We don't have a specific health track as you can see right here, but if your web app, for instance, can help save Alzheimer's patients money, it can qualify as an economic hack. If your web app can help dispose of medical equipment in an environmentally conscious way, it can qualify as an environmental hack. The winning teams for each of these tracks will receive $200. We have more. We have over $15,000 in prizes. We have other prize categories, including best high school hack, best use of Google Cloud, best data visualization hack, the sixth extinction, pale blue dot, among many others. Prizes for these hacks include a Google Cloud Patagonia backpack, the opportunity to host a panel with TEDx Harvard College, HyperX gaming gear, Amazon gift cards and $1,000 in AWS credits, $5,000 in Google Cloud credits, Venus flytraps, plus much more. Continuation hacks are allowed, however, they are only eligible for two prizes, which is the best continuation hack and the Google Cloud COVID-19 fund. 
continuation hacks must fill out a separate form. Any hack that started before the end of this opening ceremony will be considered a continuation hack. We also have various prizes and resources for everyone attending today. So this includes Wolf Ram 1 Dirty Day Access, Bubble IO Premium Plan, Voice Flow Professional License, Balsamic Cloud 90 Day Extended Trial, Rift Analytics Video Conferencing Access, as well as much more. So now let's talk about the eligibility requirements. So teams can be from anywhere between one to four people. Hacking can start right after the opening ceremony for non-continuation hacks. And you may submit your project and video pitch to DevPost by this Sunday, August 23rd at 1 p.m. Eastern in order to be eligible for our Hack for the People prizes. The closing ceremony will be also on Sunday, August 23rd at 4 p.m. Eastern, and that is when we will announce the winners. All righty, guys. So besides the $15,000 prize pool, we have 11 events scheduled throughout the weekend just for you guys. So let me break it down. We have five talks, four workshops, and two tournaments. So let me just give you a quick sample of some of the events that we have scheduled for you guys. So one of the panels that we have is a math communications panel featuring none other than Grant Sanderson of 3 Blue 1 Brown. This panel will be on Saturday at 12 p.m. Eastern time. So tomorrow at noon, the link for the call will be on the air table at, hack for the, at hackforthepeople.com slash schedule. All right. Besides that panel, we have a coffee chat featuring Hobson Lane, the CTO of Tangible AI. So in here, we plan on getting Hobson Lane's thoughts on chatbots, his experience working at an AI company, as well as how students can, can get into the startup game. And so this will be on Saturday at 8 p.m. Eastern time. And the link will be at hackforthepeople.com slash schedule. So let me just say that again, hackforthepeople.com slash schedule. Besides that, we have a basics of web dev workshop for all the new players out there. So this is perfect for anyone that wants to get into web development or uh, doesn't know uh, a good place to start in programming. So you'll be able to learn uh, the basics of HTML, CSS, as well as a quick intro to React. So this will be this evening at 9 p.m. Eastern time. And the link, as I've said multiple times before, will be at hackforthepeople.com slash schedule. All right, besides that, we have not only one Minecraft tournament, but we have two building competitions that are happening throughout this weekend. So one building competition will be who can build the best house and the other will be who can build the best evil layer. So get creative. So the best house competition will be tonight at 11 p.m. Eastern time. The best evil layer competition will be tomorrow at 11 p.m. Eastern time. So if you're tired of programming or you just want to have some late uh, night gaming, please just join as well. Uh, this is, uh, we, we only have 40 spots in the server. So please sign up beforehand on the type form, which can be found in the hacker guide. So that it will be under events at the very end of the hacker guide. So for these two tournaments, you can also win sick HyperX gaming gear. So this includes headphones, headsets, keyboards, and mouse pads. So be sure to join and you can win big. All right, so that was just a quick sample of some of the events that we have going on this weekend. And so if you wanna learn more, just go to hackforthepeople.com slash schedule. I'll say it again because this link is very important for anyone who wants to join the events. Hackforthepeople.com slash schedule. All righty. So you might have already noticed that Google Cloud has given us a lot of free stuff for the prizes. So we have the Google Patagonian backpack, as well as $5,000 in GCloud credits. And so Google Cloud is a partner. And so they want to have a quick word with our opening ceremonies. So. All right. Can you guys hear my audio? Yes, we can see it and hear it. Can you hear it? Yes. 
Thank you. Um, All right, there's no sound. Um, let me quickly stop the stream and then let me reshare so I can share the sound. All right, technical difficulties. And then let me just restart from the beginning. Hi, everyone. My name is Ryan Matsumoto, and I'm a developer advocate at Google. Our challenge for the weekend is about Google Cloud. Cloud computing is all about getting things done using someone else's computers. So when you use Google Cloud, you're getting things done using Google's computers. Google Cloud lets you build and host applications and websites, store data, and analyze data, all on Google's highly scalable and reliable computing infrastructure. We have a suite of developer products that you can try out in your hackathon projects this weekend. We have App Engine, which is good for deploying web apps and mobile backends to the cloud. We also have Firebase, which is our mobile development platform featuring the real-time database. We also have other databases like Cloud Firestore, Cloud SQL, and Cloud Storage. We also have Google Maps Platform, which gives you the power of Google Maps data in an API format. I also want to highlight our Google Cloud Machine Learning APIs. These allow you to gain insights about your data using pre-trained machine learning models hosted on Google Cloud. What's awesome about these is that you don't actually have to know any machine learning yourself to use them. You're simply using the power of Google Cloud's machine learning to help you analyze your data. We have APIs for video intelligence, vision, speech, natural language, and translation. Vision APIs for analyzing images. One feature is landmark section, detecting important places in your photo like the Diamond Head Mountain in Hawaii. There's also label detection, which gives you descriptions of what's going on in the photo, like sea and body of water, as well as a confidence score from zero to 100% for each one. There's also face detection, which detects different faces in the photo, along with their locations, as well as emotions like joy, sorrow, and anger, and how likely they are for each person. Our natural language API is great for analyzing pieces of text. There's entity detection, which detects important keywords in your text, like Google users, phone, and Android. There's also sentiment analysis to tell you how positive or negative your piece of text is. We have an API challenge this weekend for best use of Google Cloud. Just use any Google Cloud product in your project to qualify. Each member of the winning team will receive a Google Cloud Patagonia backpack, a trophy, and a water bottle. We also have a second challenge, the Google Cloud COVID-19 Hackathon Fund. We are looking for outstanding projects that use Google Cloud to solve for COVID-19 related challenges. Selected projects will receive an invitation to apply for up to $5,000 of additional Google Cloud credits and guidance from Google developers. Potential categories include healthcare and life sciences, economic impact, social engagement, and education and distance learning. You can visit g.co slash learncloud slash hackathon dash fun for more details. To get started with Google Cloud, visit bit.ly slash hack for people dash Google to request $25 in Google Cloud credits. We have a Google Cloud Tech Talk today at 7 p.m. Eastern time, where I'll be covering App Engine, Machine Learning APIs, and Cloud Firestore. We also have a Firebase Tech Talk recording available from the organizers where Andrea covers several key Firebase products. If you have any questions or need help, ping us on Discord, and we're happy to help you. Thank you. All righty, guys. Um, as well, I'm on the slider right now, and I see someone has asked a question. So is Google Cloud recommended even for first-time hackers? And is it beginner-friendly? So I, myself, have never used Google Cloud, but uh, Ryan Max and Cloud Firestorm, where I'll be covering having a Google Cloud Tech Talk this evening at 7 p.m. So if you want to learn or just want to see what's up, just please join ahead on the uh, join uh, for the event. And then maybe you can implement it into your project. So I think a Google, a few Google products are, are pretty intuitive. And so I think they, they probably did a good job on making Google Cloud pretty uh, beginner friendly. All right. Moving on from there, let me just, uh, reshare so you do not hear audio. All right, Kelly, All take right. it away. 
All right, awesome. Let's outline the next four hours. So right now you are currently at the opening ceremonies for Hack for the People. At 12 p.m., we're going to have a team formation event in which you can meet other hackers and hopefully find people for your team to create your hackathon project for this weekend. At 1 p.m., we're gonna have our first workshop, Intro to Brokerage Technology, and this will be hosted by the CTO of Tasty Trade. At 2 p.m. Eastern, we're going to have another workshop or talk called Programmers, the Next Gen of Humans and Digital Rights Defenders, and this will be hosted by the IO Foundation. We also have various other talks and workshops throughout the next few days, and be sure to check out our schedule to find out all the event details, to check out what time, and also to get the Zoom link for them. All right. We could definitely have not gotten to where we are today without the help of all our sponsors. Our sponsors um, helped us get all those amazing prizes you we talked about earlier and as seen on the dev post. So we owe a huge thanks to all of our sponsors. In addition, we also owe a huge thanks to our partners who have helped us a lot with outreach. And, and yeah, we have lots of thanks to, to give to them as well. All right, guys. So this is a quick slide with all the resources that you will need for the rest of, for the remainder of the hackathon. So we've already put the slideshow on the Discord announcements. Uh, it might have been already piled up by a few other announcements, but the slideshow is shared with all of you so you can view it. And so whenever you guys have any questions or are unclear about things, first uh, refer to one of the four links over here. So the dev post, the website, the schedule, and the hacker guide. Most notably, the hacker guide should include basically everything you need for submissions. We also plan on sending out more information as the submission date nears. Um, and also for events, we have a movie night, so you can read up on there for the hacker guide. All right, so for the moment, everyone's been waiting for our keynote speaker. So he does not need much of an introduction, but he's the original designer and implementer of C++, an author of numerous C++ related books, and the 2018 Charles Stark Draper Prize recipient for engineering. Please give a warm welcome to Bjana Skolstrup on his talk of C++ and Invisible Foundation. So take it away. Let me just uh, unshare my screen so you can share. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Um, I haven't quite prepared this. Um, what can you see now? Can, can you see. can you see a picture of me and a cool guy? Yes. Okay, that was Kevin that uh, inspired me to uh, do a little bit of name dropping. Uh, that's Neil Armstrong. One of the really nice things about computing is that you can get to meet some really interesting people and sometimes go to some really interesting places. You note he's got the Eiffel Tower uh, coming out of his right shoulder. Um, he was a really smart guy, by the way. After he stopped riding rockets, he was an um, engineering professor for many years. Um, in, anyway, uh, let's get to what we're really supposed to do. Um, I'll share a different screen. Uh, yeah, uh, good old fashioned PowerPoint. I didn't have the chance to build something specific for, for, for you now. So this is, this is a talk I've, I've put together uh, before and I hope some of it is, uh, is somewhat uh, relevant. Um, one of the interesting things that I see about C++ is that it's everywhere and you don't see it. It's usually underneath what you're doing. It's uh, underneath your, all your AI in the form of TensorFlow. It's in the cars uh, controlling the automatic uh, driving and things like that. Uh, you see C++ as often as you see the engine of your car. Um, I mean, just about never if it works. So that's uh, the theme of what I'm doing here, trying to give you some, some idea of what's under the hood and, and why. I'm going to talk about the aims and foundations of C++ and then to show you some code, two case studies of some pretty fundamental bits of C++. 
Um, I'm aiming that if you if you're not C++ programmers, you'll still be able to understand most. And um, hopefully, if you're a C++ programmer, you won't get totally bored. Uh, there's a bunch of pictures here. They are all about some application of C++. Um, that picture down, down there at the bottom is a really cool place, like two degrees Kelvin. Uh, it's a great uh, cyclotron at CERN. And uh, after showing the code examples, I will talk a little bit about design principles, standardization, and uh, future stuff. Uh, as far as I can see, the purpose of working with programming languages is to have people use them to build really uh, nice things, really useful things. And uh, so I measure the quality of a programming language and the quality of its applications. People all often talk about programming languages as if it was a comp competition of having the nicest for statement. Um, I think uh, it's more about what can you really do with it uh, that actually works. And uh, C++ comes out of two traditions going back to the earliest days of uh, computing. Um, in, in the early days, people really needed to use every cycle and every byte on the machine. And they were writing in machine code. And then you got BCPL, which was the direct ancestor of C. And from there, we got C++. These languages were used for, for building uh, really uh, critical things uh, down to the hardware, uh, operating systems and, and device drivers and such. On the other hand, writing code down there is not actually that pleasant. There's not much help. There's a lot of constraints on what you can do. So people soon found out that we had to leave that level and look a little bit higher, get, um, get the languages to express things the way we think about them. And so uh, there's uh, Backus who built Fortran, which is the first language that uh, we, um, we, we, where we could express things in the uh, language of the humans rather than the machine, and then have a program translate that into machine code. And as soon as we got the physicists and the engineers got some abstractions that suited them, everybody wanted their own abstractions, COBOL for the business people and so on. And soon that was chaos because, well, nobody could talk to each other. If you spoke Fortran, you couldn't talk to people who spoke COBOL and your programs couldn't communicate. And out of that came the work that led to Simula and object-oriented programming by uh, Ole Johan Dahl there, um, which basically says, why build the, uh, the, um, the application-specific concepts into the language? Why don't let the programmers build their own? And that's how we got classes and class hierarchies. And so when I needed both, I had a project where I would need to deal with hardware directly and I would like to abstract from it. I was trying to build a distributed system. I needed to write memory managers, process schedulers, device drivers and such. And I needed to manage software on, on many different machines. So I needed abstraction and I took those two things and that's where you got C++ from. And from there, all kinds of interesting uh, things came. Uh, that, by the way, in case you didn't know it, is uh, Dennis Ritchie. And that was actually my thesis advisor, uh, David Wheeler from Cambridge. He wrote the first program on a stored program computer. We're in a very young field um, when, when you can actually, when somebody in the room can know the first guy was doing it. Okay, what do I mean by direct uh, use of the machine? Um, we have a machine model in C and C++. The primitive operations map directly to, um, to the machine, sorry, the language operations map straight to the machine uh, code. So if you do an integer add, well, you get the integer add um, instruction, no interpretation or indirection or anything like that. And memory is simply a sequence of objects uh, that you have lying in memory and you can address them with machine addresses, uh, used, not usually known as pointers or references. And you can make more complicated objects by simple concatenation, stick a bunch of 
objects of the same type next to each other and you have an array and uh, you can have combinations of different types. You get classes and structures. And if you need to have something elsewhere or have something that uh, changes, you use uh, pointers, which maps to machine addresses. This is really, really simple. And that is actually one of the key reasons that C and C++ uh, is, um, our successes. Um, this is a simple, uh, abstraction of hardware that was done by Dennis Ritchie, so I can praise it. And uh, it has uh, stood the test of time. This is what we all depend on directly or indirectly. Uh, on the other hand, you have to get away from uh, the hardware to, to be productive, uh, to be able to build larger systems, to compose software from different sources. Uh, the problem is that abstraction sometimes gets very expensive. And it's very easy to get into the situation where the overhead of, of using your abstraction is sort of 99% of your computer's power. And since C++ was designed to work at a relatively low level and build the foundation for things, uh, we couldn't afford that. So we have the zero overhead um, principle. We wanted our abstractions to be very affordable. So what you don't use, you don't pay for. And what you do use, you couldn't hand code any better, at least not unless you use a simpler machine code. And uh, there's lots of examples where we, we reach this uh, zero overhead um, idea, complex numbers, dates, tuples, points and graphics and such. No memory overhead, no indirect function calls, no need to put stuff in free store and good inlining. And if that's not enough, we can shift some of the work to um, compile time uh, and uh, just pre-compute the answers. And basically, if you look at our systems, it's abstraction all the way down. Uh, even our hardware is an abstraction. There's no computers that directly execute uh, x86 instructions anymore. There's a layer of silicon that translates that into a different instruction set that is much easier to execute, much easier to dynamically um, ex uh, to dynamically reorder, and so on. It's, it's abstractions all the way down. And at each level, a good abstraction can simplify understanding, can simplify use, and can even simplify optimization by expressing things that uh, you want optimized more clearly. Uh, so that uh, the optimizers can understand it. One of my rules of thumb is if I can't understand the code, probably the compiler uh, will have trouble and the optimizer will be able to know how to optimize it. And one thing to remember to keep abstraction under control is uh, abstract from concrete example. Don't sit around dreaming about what's the most abstract things you can do. From there comes bloat. But if you take a concrete example and generalize it, you can maintain performance and you can make sure that the things you want to say at a higher level, uh, if they're simple, you can express them simply. And um, this, this, these ideas actually led to a fairly large uh, user community. Uh, the best survey is four and a half million, maybe five million uh, C++ users worldwide. And it seems to be growing by about 100,000 a year. And it's all over the world. I didn't mention Antarctica. There's probably some use down there anyway, but I just don't know about it. And it's in, in, in most of the uh, industries, uh, prominent in finance and games, uh, deep in the web infrastructure, web applications like Google and Facebook, databases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not all sort of super fancy kind of stuff. There's a little application there that runs a coffee machine. Uh, you don't actually need a whole server farm to, to run a C++ program. Um, yeah, and there's C++ in outer space. Um, but again, back to, to what matters. Um, in system development, we everything we do to build an application matters and not just the programming language. I, I really get annoyed by programming language fanatics. Um, you should know programming languages, preferably many, 
or at least a few. And that way you get a better perspective. In the end, what matters is applications and how they, they serve people to do something good. And so you go through this whole list of things here, which will uh, create a whole multi-year university course if we try it for it. So I won't. Uh, but one thing to remember is that being the best of one or two things isn't sufficient in uh, the sort of the infrastructure game. Uh, language must be good enough for everything that is being used for in a domain and uh, just working on a detail or two and not uh, looking at the big picture is not going to help. Um, sometimes performance is important, sometimes it isn't. And uh, if I have a bias towards performance, it's because that's the domain I usually uh, work at. If C++ ran really slowly, we would see, say, every Java application starting to run really slowly because it depends on it. So let's look at some code. I can't talk about programming and, and such without showing some code. And I'm going to show two things, something about resource management and something about generic programming. And interestingly enough, both of uh, these have their roots in the earliest C++. Um, if you look at the first paper I wrote in 81 and uh, look at my notes, these were things I was thinking about and they are completely pervasive in modern C++. And also I chose them because they illustrate some points where C++ differs a bit from, from most other languages and uh, they, they, they combine. And so let's look at the resource management. A resource is something that must be acquired and then given back. And uh, examples in memory is memory itself, locks, file handles, sockets, thread handles, things like that. And uh, there's a problem with resources is that every librarian will tell you that people will take books out, but they'll forget to give them back. So, um, and in programming, if you acquire some memory or acquire a lock, a lot of bugs happens if people have to put, put uh, give them back and then forget. So we must avoid manual resource management. So um, the way, uh, because a resource leak will make a computer fail eventually. And if you hold on to a resource that is for a long time and then give it back much too late, um, the computer uh, is slow. If you keep all your resources for twice as long, you need a twice as big computer because uh, half, uh, if you can halve the num a long time you hold on to a resource, well, you got the other half and the half machine back. So the solution is to have explicit acquisition of um, resources and implicit uh, release at the end of scopes. So this is the way it works here as a function. It takes a vector of n integers. That of course means it has to acquire from the heap, from the free store, from the dynamic memory, whatever you want to call it, uh, n integers, where n might be a large number. And here I want a file stream, which wants to open a file and then set up the buffer structure needed for communicating with it. And so we want to use it and then we want to clean up the mess. We want to give back the integers. We want to give back the buffers. We want to give back the, the file handle. And that's all done automatically at the end of scope here. Uh, so that's, that's sort of one of the key ideas in uh, C++. And the way it's done is that you take the, the really basic hardware abstractions, like a pointer to some elements and a uh, um, and the size saying how much, how many elements you've got. And then to build a higher level uh, abstraction, a class vector of some element type, I say, okay, I need a constructor that acquire the resources, initialize the structure so that you can use it. Um, so here I want a vector of doubles with some well-known constants. And I want a vector of strings with some well-known language designers. Notice that the element type here is a, a parameter to the type. And so the vector constructor here, uh, construct fills up the data structure. We use it and at the end, everything's cleaned up. So 
there's no leaps, there's no possibility of forgetting to release these resources because it's automatic. And that's done by the function called the destructor here. Um, and um, uh, it, it just uh, reverses the operations of the constructor. And this is, uh, this is completely pervasive in um, the C++ standard library and many other libraries. Uh, it's known as the strange name resource acquisition is initialization, which was a phrase I thought up and shows why I shouldn't be in advertising. Um, but basically all of the standard library containers manage the elements like that. Uh, there's a handle, which is what we use to manipulate things. And behind it is a representation that we um, don't have to know too much about. We have vectors, lists, singly linked lists, maps, hash tables, sets, multi-sets, strings, and, and many more. And some of the classes that are done this way are not actually just plain memory. Uh, threads, for instance, lock guards, the, the file streams that keeps track of files, and some smart pointers that uh, looks after their, um, the thing they point to and delete it when necessary. And so uh, these non-memory resources shows the strength of the approach of constructors and destructors because it handles things that aren't just memory. A garbage collector uh, doesn't do this right. If you think finalizers will do it, you have to read up on uh, finalizers. Um, a container can hold non-memory resources, and so it all works recursively. I can have a vector of tuples of strings and uh, threads and i streams. That may be uh, the name of the file uh, of that i stream that's run on that thread or something like that. This one creates very simply and recursively and is cleaned up um, in the opposite order of construction at the end. So it's, it's all very automatic. Uh, generic programming is, is, a, is a different way of looking at things. And it is related because once you start writing with abstractions and you say, I want a vector. And very soon after you say vector of what? If you're an old style physicist, a vector of um, double precision floating point numbers is all that you ever need. But um, that's not true for everybody and it's not even true for physicists anymore. So we want to say, what is this thing a vector of? And so we say, okay, it's a vector of elements and we can specify what it takes to be an element, uh, usually just to copy the, uh, be able to copy the thing. So we now say here we have a vector, it's a class. Uh, so you just define type, it's the idea we got from Christ uh, Nugo on Simula. Any language that uses the word class uh, to mean user-defined type can say thanks to Preston uh, and the Uli Johan that he worked with, um, because that's where that idea comes from. They, 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 didn't, they weren't computer scientists because there was hardly any computer scientists at the time. They were mathematicians and they knew about classes, but not about types. Anyway, we now have a class vector that takes elements and we can say we want a vector of integer. So then we can have a constructor that says how to get 100 integers. And we can have a vector of strings that takes a, a, a set of elements. As soon as we've got this working, of course, we want our operations to be parameterized just like our data. So I want to say, um, I want to sort something that's sortable and I want to sort something that's sortable using a predicate to do comparisons. Uh, for example, here I want to sort a vector of integers. It will use the less than, which is the default sort. And a vector of, uh, of strings sorted by uh, greater than uh, as the pre predicate. So you can see the parameterization very soon goes from from uh, we want a little bit of parameterization, so we want to parameterize quite complicated things. And uh, this is the backbone of all the uh, C++ uh, data structures and algorithms. Uh, to be usable, uh, algorithm must be very flexible and, and fast. Uh, sorting data, for instance, should be generic in what kind of place we contain the vector the data, what stuff the vector in, 
uh, what's the element of the vector uh, string integers and what operations are we doing when we are doing our sort uh, for instance uh, equals and it's done by a notion an abstraction which is a sequence of elements uh, so the elements in a container is, is represented as a sequence of elements and then we are generic over all of these three things and you can look in the stl the uh, template standard uh, standard template library that's part of the C++ standard library, ISO C++, and you'll find it. You can find Grail in uh, V. Find is an algorithm that looks uh, through to find something. Find if uh, it looks through a list here, uh, looking for something where X is less than 42. This is the C++ notation for lambdas, uh, a way to express a, a predicate. And uh, there is a lot of that in the standard library and other libraries, containers, algorithms. The concurrency support relies on this the random number generation, the strings, and some numerics. Uh, compared with the big commercial libraries, this is all very small, but it's very foundational. And sometimes it is foundational to the uh, larger uh, commercial libraries. Um, I started working on this back in the early 80s. I uh, didn't get much progress till about 87 when I decided that I needed three things to, for this to be successful. It had to be extremely general and flexible. I, I had to be able to express much more than I could imagine because any one person's imagination is sort of limited and you have to sort of take care of more than just yourself. So it had to be extremely general. Uh, it had to be zero overhead. Personally, I wanted to write very high performance data structures, uh, vectors, hash tables, and things like that to compete with, with hand code at C. And so we needed zero overhead. And I'm a great fan of well-specified interfaces. I doubt anybody on this call can remember when C didn't have uh, function prototypes. You could say what the uh, argument types were for a uh, uh, a function call like square root of two would crash because uh, it didn't know that square root took a double and an int isn't a double. Uh, I was the one that put that stuff into C. That's a very long time ago. So I'm pointing that out because I know the value of uh, well-specified interfaces. I just couldn't get them. In uh, 87, I, I just, nobody knew how to get all three as far as I uh, still know. Um, so I started with macros in 88, I came up with templates, uh, which gave the two first, it, they're very flexible and they have zero overhead and the interfaces had no decent specifications. So it, it gave awful complicated code, awfully um, bad error messages. Uh, however, the first two properties were good enough to make it a runaway success. Um, this was one of the things that kept C++ uh, running faster than anything else. And uh, people were willing to suffer the pain of the problems to get the benefits. Okay, so back to the drawing board, try to solve this problem completely. Um, together with some uh, friends of mine, Gabitas Reyes, Andrew Sutton, and others, we managed to build something called Concepts, inspired by uh, uh, Alex Stefanov, who's the father of generic programming in C++, that supports precise specification of generic interfaces. And it's now part of C++ 20, and it ships with GCC and Microsoft, and uh, that's one of the distributions of Clang that also got it. So it's there. It'll be official standard by the end of the year and shipping more compilers next year. So, as I said, templates were useful and widely popular. Um, they had, uh, basically only supported compile time doc typing. Uh, and that gave write only code, unmaintainable code, and truly spectacularly bad error messages. Uh, had to do something about it. And the solution is uh, use compile time programming uh, using const expert functions, not simply functions that calculates at compile time. And if what you want to generate is a value at compile time, you call a function to do it. You don't like, uh, write a strange template metaprogramming. 
And secondly, once you write uh, your, um, your, your generic functions, you use concept to specify the argument types. And this looks sort of like this. Here I want to do my sort of a container. And I'm saying that C has to be a, a range that can be sortable. So basically anything that I can access the way I access my data, which is as a sequence of elements, and a quarter range, and it had to be sortable. You can look up in the uh, standard what uh, sortable means. You've been able to look uh, that up since uh, 98. It says that to be sortable, you have to ha be a random access sequence, and your elements have to be compared with less than. It takes about a page in English to say that precisely. Uh, this is what this says. But we have to say it in code for the compiler to understand it. Anyway, let's see if we can use this one first. There's a vector with some numbers. There's a list with some numbers. I'm sorting the vector. When I have a vector of integers, I should say vector of integers here. It's, I was saving too much space for the slides. Um, it says, is a, is a vector of integer sortable? Yeah, it's a range, it has uh, random access and integers can be sorted fine, so this works. So then I try to sort a list, it says, well, is a list a sortable range? It's a range, yes, but it doesn't have random access, so the answer is no. Uh, and you get this error message down here or something like it. Uh, early versions of the implementation uh, simply gave me this sentence here, which is much better than the pages of nonsense you could get out of the old C++ compilers. Um, and what if I wanted to, um, to sort a list? Once you get interfaces, your code get flexible, and you can use that information. So here we have the sort of a range sort, which you can actually find in the uh, standard. And I want my own sortable of a forward range. A forward range is a range that you can traverse from the beginning to the end, but doesn't guarantee random access. Okay, you can write that. One of the ways is just to copy them all into a vector, sort the vector and copy the elements back again. Uh, that's a three line code, if that's what you want. There's also clever algorithms that can do that faster, but uh, this is a dot, 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 uh, and, uh, exercise for the implementer. So I try to sort my vector again, and it goes through the song and dance. Yeah, sortable range can sort a vector. Um, we try with a list. It can't sort uh, uh, so sortable, but it can do with this one because a forward range uh, is what a vector can do. And the, the rule of thumb is we always pick the um, alternative that has the strictest criteria. Uh, if the criteria are subsets of each other. If the criteria, the concepts are not subsets, it's an ambiguity, we throw it out. But if exactly one is the best match, we use it. So we don't have to write a lot of code specifying how these uh, concepts of sortable range and forward range relate to each other because the compiler already knows that. That means we don't get the rigidity of say C, uh, sort of Java class hierarchies and things like that. This is much more composable, much more uh, flexible along the lines of generic programming. And you define the concepts quite simply. This is not rocket science. So a type T is a sort of a range if it, oh God, that should have been an R, type name R. Uh, a, a, a type R is a sort of a range if it is a random access range and if it has an iterator that's sortable. Now, random access range, sortable, and uh, iterator uh, is defined in the standard library. Uh, you can find them. Uh, a random access has to have a begin end plus plus subscripting. Uh, and a sortable thing has to have iterators that you can compare swap. So basically, you can build this very simply out of the uh, standard library, which is always the best way of writing code. If you don't have, if you have to write the low-level stuff yourself, it gets a bit tedious. If you have to do the uh, low-level thing yourself, like the implementer of the standard library, you have to start defining your concepts 
which are these predicates or what types says, are you a random access range? Are you an iterator and such? Uh, then you have to express that in terms of the basic language. So let's see how we can do that. So T is a range. If an, uh, if the, if a, if an A of type T um, has a beginning and an end and they return iterators. And if that type they call iterator really is an iterator, Here's another concept that says what it means to be an, it, an input iterator, then we're fine. So you can you can do it. We now reach basically all the way down to the basic type stuff. Now, one thing I've been thinking about for a long, long time is how do you actually evolve a language? One thing that was really clear to me uh, from roughly day one was that there was no way I could build a complete programming language that will solve the problem for every problem I would like to solve on day one. I wanted something that should be usable for about now and then evolve over time. And so to avoid that from going totally out of control, there has to be some principles and they have to be articulated because a language is more than a collection of features and also a didn't want to solve just particular problems. I want to have a general mechanism for expressing ideas. And uh, I didn't want to be pressurized into adding every fashionable feature because you know fashions come and go. And also stability and evolution is always at a, um, uh, in, 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 there's a tension between them. Uh, we would like to evolve things, we would like to get rid of old bad stuff that was good 20 years ago, but isn't anymore. But we can't break billions of lines of code. So we have to, to balance this all the way. And um, this is not a new idea. Uh, the design rules uh, were outlined in Design Revolution of C++, which was in uh, 1994. And here's some examples. Um, one of the rules is that C++ is a practical tool. It's not an academic exercise. We have to be driven by real problems. And uh, we have want to, language to be viable at, at any time. Uh, don't, don't spend all your time trying to look for perfection. By the time you find perfection, you'll find that the world has changed and its notion of perfection has changed too. So you can't get there anyway. Um, and always provide a transition path. If you ever get any users for anything you build, you acquire a responsibility to those users and you mustn't just uh, break everything and force them to rework everything from scratch. This is sort of ideas for, for C++. Not every language has it. Not every uh, people who build a system has those constraints or want to have those constraints, but those were the ones I chose and details for what it means you can find in, in the design evolution of C++. In the language technical uh, areas, no implicit violations of the static type system. It is absolutely clear back in, um, in 81 and in 94, even today, that we couldn't meet this ideal perfectly. But every year since, we've gotten closer and closer. When, when I first wrote this one down, C didn't have function argument checking. So I had to start putting that in. And uh, so that, that's very, um, very fundamental. I really don't like the preprocessor. If you've written C or C++ and uh, suffered from macros, uh, you know what I mean. Uh, I try very hard these days to write code that, that doesn't have any macros in it. And with C++ 20, I can even get rid of the includes. We're getting modules. We should be able to write code that has absolutely no hash um, uh, codes in them, gone. Uh, it'll take at least a decade, maybe two, to make sure that that actually happens in all the real world code. But I can write code today that meets my ideals from back in the 80s. Uh, yes, and it meets the zero overhead principle. As a matter of fact, it does it much better than before. And if you move things to compile time, you can actually write code that is negative overhead in the sense that if you write it in a language where you have to do things at runtime, 
it gets slow because runtime is slower than compile time usually. And so there's a bunch of uh, key design choices. Uh, we have, uh, we need static type system, but we want equal support for built-in type and user-defined types. Uh, a lot of languages starting in the simula had two kinds of types. There were the ones that was provided uh, by the compiler, like int. And then there was the ones you built yourself, like com com uh, complex. And I could never see why there should be a difference between those two. I mean, some languages have complex that's uh, a built-in type and others don't. Uh, some uh, languages have uh, int being like a, uh, a built-in type and such. So we need equal support for that. We need value and reference uh, semantics because value semantics is the nicest and reference semantics is actually what you need to implement things on the hardware. And so there's a whole bunch of um, criteria here that uh, reflects the ideals of C++ from the earliest days and is a pretty good approximation in uh, current C++. Uh, C++ currently is controlled by a standards committee under ISO rules. And uh, that's sort of the, the hardest standards to get and the hardest standards to make. So it's a gold standard for standards. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't been standardized how you make a standard or what a standard is. So uh, it's a whole other set of problems, but that's a different talk. Uh, we aim for long-term stability and a standards committee is, is uh, one way of uh, preventing random change and multiple changes in different directions. And it is vendor neutral. So it's really hard for big organizations to push the language in, in their favorite directions. You could imagine AT&T in the old days, then IBM, then Microsoft, uh, now maybe Google. Uh, we have a standards committee to try and create some stability here. On the other hand, it means we don't have any development funds uh, because nobody owns it and people like to invest in their own stuff. There's dangers of a standard. You can get designed by a committee, you get stagnation, diversion directions and over elaboration, you just have to fight that. This is, this is a lot of work. There's a lot of dangers, but we've survived now for oh, about 30 years. So maybe we'll manage. Uh, here's the committee. These are the guys you have to thank if uh, your, your programs actually work uh, to your satisfaction. And these are the ones you blame if they don't. But uh, don't be too quick to blame others for, for problems in your own code. So we started with a fairly small committee and it grew and it grew and it grew. And it's even bigger for C20. Now you see the problem. How do you get a group of people like that to agree to anything? This is hard. And so it's a bit of a miracle, but it's worked so far. Uh, so we, we got the first standard in 98. That was a solid uh, workhorse. In 11, we got a major improvement, better language, better concurrent support, support regular expressions, random numbers, lambdas, et cetera, et cetera. 14, we had to uh, complete things. Whenever you have a big delivery, uh, a, a big release, uh, there's two things that hold back uh, progress. One is you have to have a feature freeze. So you can't deliver things that you just designed yesterday. Furthermore, there's things you don't learn till you have actually used things at scale with all the features present. And so for that reason, when you have a major release here, like 11, you actually need a couple of years to clean up uh, things and, 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 uh, com and uh, complete it. So that's what we did. And we started working on concepts, modules, and networking. Uh, C++ 17 should have had something like that. It got a lot of uh, major, uh, minor features, but it didn't get the big ones. The big ones came in 20. Uh, it's coming now. Uh, 20 will not be a standard till uh, the end of the year, but uh, it's already shipping. Concepts, modules, code teams, the range library, and others and it's shipping in the major compilers. Uh, of course, this is not perfect. There's endless challenges uh, still to come. Uh, you can see um, 
you, you, you can see that hardware is changing very fast just now. Um, we've got much better ways of building hardware. And since the fundamental single line uh, processing isn't getting any faster, we, we are getting a lot of um, hardware architecture changes to utilize all of those, um, uh, those transistors, GPUs, FPGAs, all kinds of specializing things, current currency model. There's a lot of work in this area. We need to simplify the use. I mean, you can write uh, truly horrible, complicated C++, but you don't have to. So we need to simplify through generalization and supporting um, common cases. We need to maintain stable. There are billions of lines of code, hundreds of billions of lines of code out there. People always want three things. They want a simpler language, uh, they want two extra features and they won't guarantee that their code doesn't break and you can't get all three. Um, so we work on that and we need to educate the community and we want to improve everything. This is um, a Greek hero, Heracles or Hercules, and he's fighting a particularly nasty um, monster called the Hydra. It had the special property that if you chop a head off the Hydra, it grows two more. And that's a, trying to, to help the software development feels a little bit like that. Things are changing very fast, but we're working on it. Um, one of the ways we're working about it is to try and uh, write a set of guidelines for how you write with C, modern C++. Uh, you can write C++ that's type and resource safe. No leaks, no memory corruption, no garbage collector, no limitation of expressibility, uh, no performance degradation. It's still C++, not some third subset. Oh yeah, and I don't want to design a new language. So this is ISO C++. And we want tool enforcement of, of this. We actually want to be able to stick a program in, uh, have it checked and make sure that all of these properties are there. And some of this is still work in progress and some is shipping. If you use um, Visual Studio, uh, you can ask for the uh, core guidelines checker and it will catch uh, all memory leaks and all stray pointers. So that kind of complaint about C++ is, is, is soon the past. It's the past in some areas and, and it scales. It scales to million line programs. This is called the C++ Core Guidelines. It's an open source project uh, with participants from quite a few places. There's a tiny support library which we want to put out of business by making it standard. But anyway, if you want to know how to write uh, modern C++, that's one place to look. And basically this was what I um, wanted to say. And so we can we can open up uh, for some questions if you have some, and I'll I'll try and answer. All righty, thank you, Dr. Skostrup, for such a great presentation. And right now uh, we have a few questions on the Slido. So, uh, one of which uh, is asked by Kiki. And she's asking, what applications of C++ are you, the, are you most proud of? Um, I, I tend to be sort of most excited by the sort of the, the scientific and, and technologically advanced things. Like just down there is uh, one of the experiments at, um, at, at CERN, uh, one of the ones that found uh, Higgs boson. And I found this kind of thing really cool. How do you control a cyclotron that whizzes something around at 99.99999% uh, of the uh, speed of light? I mean, how do you know how to turn the uh, magnets on and off at just the right time? Because otherwise you have something that is by now as heavy as a 747 fully loaded. Okay, it's a subatomic particle, but at that speed, it's really, really, well, it, it, it can uh, create a lot of damage. And also the calculations for doing this, the data analysis for that, that's cool. And then, of course, the Mars rovers and um, all, all the SpaceX uh, spaceships and 
uh, one of the days I was quite surprised to learn that the matrix was uh, done in C++. Uh, I'm, I'm more interested in scientific things and there's some medical equipment and such. Uh, what have we got here? There we've got, uh, oh yeah, the Human Genome Project was done using C++. As, as one of the people that did it says, yeah, of course, they're strings, aren't they? So that kind of stuff. All right. Uh, what other question? So Carmen Chan asks, do you think the future of programming language languages will be more high level extensions uh, or to more low level languages or more from like scratch? Um, I think there'll be different languages and they'll have different aspects. When people talk about everybody writing code, the kind of code everybody can write uh, has to be in a high level language with a lot of support because everybody are not trained mathematicians or engineers uh, who knows how to build systems that are uh, robust, reliable and correct. Uh, other languages has to be aimed at people who are trained to write reliable, correct uh, and performant systems. And it's those systems I'm most interested in. And as I said before, I think the main problem at that area is to lift from the hardware to some more human level. That is provide abstractions that are foundational and useful and then uh, get them to run well on, uh, on hardware. And uh, the languages for using that is not the same as, uh, as the people for, for writing a web app. So C++ is good for writing, say, a JavaScript interpreter. All the major ones are C++. So if you've ever written a, C++, a, a, a JavaScript program, you've used C++. Um, same with a Google uh, lookup, that's uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, and C++ is a language that's, that's down there. And so it's, it's not really high level or low level. The idea is to get from the low level to the high level. So some people are called C++ a stretch language. Uh, or I, I don't know the right word for it, but, but it's both because it has to cover that gap between the hardware and uh, good abstractions fit for humans. All right. Um, by the way, everyone, Please continue asking questions on the Slido. I've already linked the, the link in the YouTube chat. Uh, but I guess one question that I have um, is when you were di designing C++, did you ever think uh, this language would become so big and so widely used? Like, did, did that thought ever occur to you? Um, no way, no way. I had no clue. I was, uh, for starters, too busy uh, getting it to work and supporting my users to uh, actually think in such big terms. And I guess a follow-up question is, uh, when when did you realize like you you were onto something pretty pretty big with C plus um, plus? It it sort of came gradually. Uh, in, in the 80s, in the 80s is sort of a blur for me because I was so busy. I was designing, implementing, teaching, documenting. Um, I was a help desk, um, a lot of things like that. But, but maybe the, 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 there's a very specific place. If I hadn't rea realized it before that day, I certainly did it that day. Representatives from IBM, Sun, and HP turned up in my office at Bell Labs and said, you need to standardize C++. And I said, oh, no, I'm not ready. I'm still working on this. This is too soon. Uh, and they said, no, 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 you, you don't get it. Uh, our corporations, and they're talking about the sort of three of the biggest um, manufacturers and users of uh, computers in the world at the time cannot depend on a language owned by a corporation that is possibly becoming a competitor. Of course, we, we, we will trust you. Uh, we can't trust h and but we can trust you, but you may get run over by a bus. So you need to standardize this. And 
there's not really a choice. It will be standardized on the ISO rules. It's just whether you help us or not. And, and you know that it will be better if you help us. That's very uh, complimentary, of course, and they were right. Uh, so a year later, we started standardization. But, but certainly uh, that day, I must have realized I was on to something uh, off the usual scale. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Strostra. We have a few other questions. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you so much for um, taking the time to give us this presentation as someone who's transitioning from C to C++. It's definitely a very interesting talk. So one person has a question on what is the best way for a Java developer to learn more C++, being that they're both object-oriented language. Yeah. Um... One thing that people sometimes don't realize is that different people learn differently and different people, different background has different needs. And so um, I actually wrote a book for reasonably experienced programmers coming from other languages, not specifically Java, it could be C, it could be uh, C++ 98 um, or, or something like that. It's called a tour of C++. Um, and uh, it's, it has a, a nice pro a property. It's about this thick. Uh, you can read it in the weekend. And uh, it will it'll get, uh, get to the point where you can see that sometimes the syntax is the same, but the uh, meaning is not uh, the same. The design styles are not the same. And that little book will, will help uh, understand what C++ can cannot do compared to Java or whatever other language you come from. Um, I have two other books out. One, the big thick one that explains everything, um, which is definitely for people who want to write heavy duty C++ code for a living. And then there's a rather thick book that's for beginners teaching them programming using C++. Um, the, the three books have different needs, and the, the correct one for that question is a tour of C++. It's in the, uh, uh, the, the second edition. Awesome. All right, let's go on to the next question. So someone is asking, how does your work with C++ offer you new perspectives at Morgan Stanley? Okay. Um, I was rather surprised uh, when I ended up uh, working for Morgan Stanley. Um, what happened was that, you know, I said that C++ is, has to be driven by needs and by real applications. So to avoid being in a bubble, every year I used to visit five or six places uh, and talk about their, their needs and their problems and give a talk. And, Basically learn. And uh, one year um, I was uh, visiting Morgan Stanley and I gave my talk and we had a good, good discussion about this and another. And after that, they uh, suggested that I should come and work for them. Now, this happens several times a year from different organizations. So I'm pretty good at saying no. And uh, each time I gave an argument, they had an argument that basically said, no, 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 that's, we can, we can do that. Uh, yes, we have the right problems. Uh, and I, I knew that people were smart. Uh, what I hadn't appreciated was how many interesting computer science problems they had. And what I had not surprised, not uh, expected at all, was that they were interested in having me work on them in sort of an open thing. I can talk to you. I don't have to, uh, uh, it's just as if I was in a university. I teach at Columbia every, uh, uh, every spring. Uh, this is not what I expected from a bank. My first answer was, but, but you're a bank. And uh, just showed that I did not know what a modern bank was at the time. And so um, the other thing that worried me is that, of course, everybody knows that people working on Wall Street are a bunch of jerks. And um, well, they, I, I ran into a lot of nice people. That, that, that thing was actually wrong for Morgan Stanley. 
uh, we had a management meeting lately where they were trying to find some of the standard uh, corporate slogans. I suggested we are not jerks, but that didn't uh, didn't quite make it. HR thought that was a bit uh, too much. But the, the point is that they're nice people who want to work in a place with nice people, who want to work in a place with hard, interesting problems. And at least if you're me, you want to be able to talk about them. And uh, Morgan Stanley uh, fulfilled that. And finally, you want to live in a place that is good for you. And it so happens that my grandchildren are in New York City where uh, Morgan Stanley is, so it, it all fitted. I guess uh, one question that I have, do you trust Morgan Stanley enough to, uh, to like give them your money and then like just let them uh, do their investment thing? Like, do you, do you invest? Sorry, I can't them? hear you. You're talking away from oh, the microphone. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you trust Morgan Stanley enough to uh, invest with them? Like, do you, do you uh, let them be like, uh, I guess you're, you're a banker. Yes. All right. Very simple answer. <laughs> I mean, now, of course, since I work for them, uh, I don't have much choice, but it is a, a matter of fact that they were managing my money before I uh, became an employee. It's, it's a good bank. Um, it's, it's, it's as honest as you find banks. And, uh, it's, it's, they take uh, regulations very seriously. They take... Uh, fulfilling the, the, the criteria of, of honesty and uh, such very seriously. All right, awesome. So we're gonna ask one other question. So someone's wondering, what are your thoughts on Rust as a replacement of C slash C++? Well, uh, good luck to them. If they are better, it will work. Uh, it's harder than they think. And I think there's uh, too much rah-rah uh, for Rust and too little actual use. Uh, there was a survey that uh, says that most people wanted to use Rust and out of the people who thought it was the best language ever, about 3% had ever written a Rust program. Um, the, the world is more complicated than you think. But it's nice right. to see a language that takes um, takes things like memory and resource safety almost as serious as C++ instead of just using a garbage collector. All right. Um, so one other question, and I'm also uh, like genuinely curious about this, is what do you do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis besides with, um, your C++ work? So what do you do? Like what would be the day in the life of, um, of the creator of C++ look like? I, I don't actually have an ordinary day. Uh, it changes. Um, I, I don't write code every day, but I certainly write code every week. Um, I give talk, I teach both internally and externally. Uh, today I talk with you, Monday and Tuesday, I talk to new trainees at um, Morgan Stanley. And uh, I, 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 I talk to my colleagues. Um, I, I write articles sometimes. Um, look at projects. The projects mostly has to do with distributed uh, systems. Uh, some to do with how to upgrade old uh, code bases. Some has to do with how do you go really, really fast. On how are you really, really um, reliable? Doing either is not too hard, but being both reliable and fast and maintainable is, is quite tricky. Um, of course, I read some uh, read some research and uh, industrial stuff too. Let's see. Yesterday, I was part of a thesis defense for a PhD at Columbia. It's, it varies a lot. Before the virus, I traveled a lot. The, the usual reasons, uh, I want to spread my idea and I want to see what the feedback I get from it and I want to see what problems people have. Do that in 
different countries, US, Europe, China, India. All right. Uh, one other question is by Timothy. And he's asking, uh, when I'm learning C++, what's the next, oh, oh yeah, what's the next logical jump after data structure? So a little bit more technical uh, compared to what we've been asking uh, earlier. Um, I think first you have to get a, a grasp of C++ and do some uh, of the exercises that goes with it. You can't just learn a programming language just by reading. It's like trying to take a correspondence course in bicycling. First time you try, you fall off anyway. Uh, so you, you go through the book or whatever, you do the exercises, and then you have to get onto a project somewhere where you can write some code that's really supposed to work and you can interact with other people that, that needs uh, your output and can give you feedback on the quality of your code and something like that. It can be a, um, an open source project. There are 10,000 of them, I think, on GitHub, so you should be able to find one. Or if you have a job, uh, it's really good to work together with uh, a more experienced uh, colleague uh, noticing that sometimes the experienced colleague knows the constraints on the solution much better than you do, but may not know the uh, latest about how you write the code. All right. And then one other question uh, submitted by Anonymous is what advice do you have for someone who knows C and is wanting to start learning C++ in a college level course. So do you have any tips or anything? Yeah, read a two of C++ second edition. Oh, you right. have to get the basics down. C and C++ are sufficiently different. You need to get into the way of abstracting well and uh, using libraries in a different way. And that book is a good start. It is being taught at uh, universities. Uh, I use it for my uh, Columbia course. I give people two weeks. The first week they read the first half, which is about the language. And the second week they read the second half, which is about the library. And then I ask them to write down what was surprising or new to them and give that back to me as a homework. That has two effects. Uh, it gives people something to focus about when they read it coming from another um, background. Could be old C++, it could be C, it could be Java. Uh, my students come from all kinds of backgrounds. And uh, secondly, it gives me the feedback about what people know and don't know. That helps me uh, with my work with C++ and the design of the next stage of it and how to explain it better. But, but that book is a good start. If you are experienced, you can get over it in, in, in two weeks or so. And after that, you really have to get to a project. I guess on that note, uh, do you do any side projects besides um, working with the standards committee of using C++? Like, I guess like recently, have you done any, uh, I guess any projects that, you, that you'd like to talk about? Not really. I do work for the bank. I'll be talking to something that I did in the bank to do with the message passing uh, at CPPCon next month. But between, between my work with uh, the C++ standard and related things to that and my work in the bank, I don't get to write any code on, on things that doesn't fit those two criteria. All right. And then I guess one question that I have, and since there's uh, a lot of newcomers for in terms of hackathon and programming in this call, I mean, at watching the live stream right now, uh, how did you learn uh, programming? I know it's it was uh, like the programming back then was definitely a lot more different than what we have now. But like, did you start by um, like doing projects, like, like having an idea, then you and then kind of making that idea into a reality? No, no, I, uh, I encountered programming and computers first in my second year of university. 
Before that, I'd basically never seen a computer. They, they filled rooms then. Um, and uh, so I, I got a, com uh, a programming course that taught me sort of four or five languages, not very deep, they were not very big. And then we wrote our exercises in alcohol 60 on a, a monstrously large, very, very slow computer. Um, it had, just, just to give you an idea of, I no, I can't give you an idea of the scale. Um, I mean, it's, what did it have? I think 1K words, and then a cache-like thing with two more K, uh, and we were doing high-level programming. It. So it was just different. And uh, after that, I got into quite a few other things. I was writing uh, business applications on small computers, and I was doing uh, microprogramming on microprogrammable computers. And, and so just basically grew up with the computer industry. Uh, uh, and uh, a Raspberry Pi 2 is a thousand times faster and has a thousand times more memory than the PDP 1170 I started C++ on. Uh, there's been a lot of change over the years. Awesome, very interesting to hear. I have a question from Carmen. You mentioned the value of being a good fit. What recommendations would you have for students finding a good fit on a team at Morgan Stanley? Um, the, okay, there's two, two, two steps here. One is to get into Morgan Stanley and the other one is to find the teams. Um, to get into Morgan Stanley, the best way is to get um, some in as a summer apprentice or get hired and get onto the um, to, to the internal training which takes many months and uh, both the the internship program and the trainee programs uh, rotate you around different departments and exposes you to uh, various parts of the banks I mean, some people are interested in money, some people are interested in bits and bytes, some people are into algorithms, some people are into uh, data analysis, some people are, there, there, there's, there's just so much. But basically get on the inside, um, get some training and uh, see what happens. Uh, this, the programs are designed to expose uh, young people to a variety of things inside the bank. All right. And uh, always look both at the subject matter and the people. You don't want to work with people that you don't like. Um, and then one last question uh, from Anonymous is, what's the best way to learn C++ if you're new to coding and find it a bit hard to understand the concepts in C++ well? It's the book called uh, Principal Practice and uh, Programming Principles and Practice Using C++. That's the one that's uh, the beginner's book. And it actually has been praised by people with several years of experience because sometimes what you have missed is the fundamentals. So if, if you're not, uh, to, if, if you need to, to learn a little bit about how you write a loop, uh, have to think about invariants. Uh, why on earth are you using classes and things like that? If questions like that are some you ask, uh, that's the book for it. It's uh, in the second edition. It has uh, swans on the uh, on the cover, big blue book. Um, in a university course, we get half the way through uh, that book, uh, and so that takes four months if you take a course. Uh, if you're reading it and doing the exercises, it may take you something similar. Uh, and uh, after that, you can, again, now's the time for a project. Then I guess one last question, and I'm genuinely so interested. We run out of time too. Yep. Well, I guess I guess we can fit in uh, one more. Is that okay with you? Okay. Um, so, so there are, uh, I guess, a few videos on, on YouTube as well as a few articles. 
uh, on the internet. And they're, they're basically like they're, there's a few researchers um, designing AI models that are able to write code. So if you just input a problem uh, they, they, like in, in English, um, the program will be able to like write the, the code solution for that. So what are your thoughts on that? Do you think, uh, like this is definitely a little far-fetched, uh, but do you think uh, AI and then like, I guess machines are gonna be able to write their own uh, code for problems? Depends on what the problem is. It sounds far-fetched. I'm not a great optimist, but you know, if you're just writing a, a sort of a, a web app for, for doing web searches, yeah, maybe. If it's trying to write the program that controls the brakes on my car or the controls on the plane I fly, fly in or the, um, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the explosive stuff that that uh, tunnel machine is doing, no way I want engineers to do that. It's, right. it's a matter of domain, domain knowledge. I guess that's all the questions that we have. And yeah. um, I just want to give a big thank you uh, to you. I, I think like you definitely uh, your, your presentation was, was remarkable. And I think it's uh, the, the questions and like just getting your, uh, your opinions and ideas and also like seeing how uh, such a big figure in the CS space, uh, such as yourself, uh, like what, what you do day to day, uh, what, what your work is at Morgan Stanley is like. It, it's definitely uh, very inspirational for all the uh, all the people watching. And I guess that's it. So uh, okay. yes, before... thank you so much. Yep. Yeah, and, and thank you very much. And uh, to everybody, good luck with the Hackathon. These are uh, fun things to do. Uh, and uh, you can learn a lot and you can meet nice people. And that's good stuff. Bye. Yep, see ya. And then I guess before I end the stream, I would just like to say one last thing. So I've already said it multiple times already, but for events, and we have consent, we have so many, just go to hackforthepeople.com slash schedule. We have loads of event, events for you. So once you're sick, sick of programming, uh, just please like just head over to here. We have them sorted by day, but they're all embedded by Airtable. So you can join in. Uh, so here's a workshop on how to build a cloud connected AR VR app. So if you want to get into app making, uh, just join in here and then you should be able to learn and also uh, hopefully implement into your project, uh, Echo AR and then AR and VR. So we have, we have loads of events uh, in store and I guess that's it. Kelly, do you have anything you want to say? Awesome, I think that's pretty much it. Thanks so much, Kevin. Um, our team formation events are starting very soon in about 20 minutes. We're going to send these slides out to everyone. So it's been a great time. And thanks for co-hosting, Kevin. All right, everyone have good luck on your projects. And we'll see you all at closing ceremonies. <sighs>